as well. <laughs> uh, fatherhood of God, brotherhood of man. His aides would say, the, the bomb fog bit's just coming up now. <laughs> no, and the re- it, one consequence of that, I think, is that uh, especially since... Uh, cultural elites who don't know that much about religious life and are trying to catch up kind of miss the story is that um, American religious people have been secularized to a tremendous degree over the past 30 years. Hierarchy within the family, attitudes towards women, attitudes towards race, all these things have changed a lot. And so there's got to also be a complex relationship to the actual mainstreaming the cultural mainstreaming of believers in in this country at one level who are living lives today. People who attend uh, evangelical megachurches are living lives that would have been seen to be crazy and sinful by evangelicals in the 1950s. Wait, that's that's an intriguing idea. Why then is it, if if that's so, if in fact things that we think of as being part of the 60s, which you also said earlier, are in part responsible for this third wave of religiosity, and yet its political valence is almost wholly conservative, how can that be if its origins in so so many ways seem, seem liberationist and its political valence seems reactionary? Well, because I think in part from what Christopher was saying, the belief is in belief, yeah? And that's become the last redoubt. After you are no no longer deriving the rules of the family, children sit at the end of the table, all kinds of hierarchy derived from a religious tradition, that becomes the fetish. And it becomes a highly symbolized fetish that you have to defend in relation to all these other things in, in, in your life. Yeah. There's one other thing which I think is at work here on the political side that we really don't like to talk about that really counts as a dirty word in American political life, and it's class. And you, know, you see this in the way that uh, the Senator Obama got, got himself into trouble sort of talking around the edges of, of the class question. And it's not here a question of exact economic demographics, because if you run the demographics, it turns out that evangelicals don't look particularly different from non-evangelicals in some general, because partly there's so many Americans who call themselves evangelicals right. that it's hard to... Was it about 40% to, of the country or so? Like, between 30 and 40%, depending on who you ask. So, but that said, part of the political movement is a sense of resentment, and you, it doesn't have to be called class resentment, but it's resentment Don't against, say bitter. Just don't say bitter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, against people who are telling ordinary folks what they should believe. And I think uh, the thing that Christopher mentioned about the teaching of evolution in the schools is a really good example of this, where the persistence of the desire to teach what was first you know, being called creationism, and then that, the Supreme Court struck that down. Then it was creation science. The Supreme Court struck that down. Intelligent design, the lower courts have struck that down. And the, the persistence, the desire to reinvent some version of this comes in part, I think, just from a resistant strand that says, we don't want people sitting in universities to tell us what we think, we, what, what we ought to believe on fundamental questions. This should be some kind of a local decision, so it plays into the language of localism. It should be a decision that we make in accordance with our beliefs. But wait, is the, is the big default thing in this country uh, this secular academic culture against which people are reacting, or is the big default thing in this country a highly Christianized discourse which makes non-believers feel marginalized? Can both of those things be true at once? Yeah. Yeah. There's, neither is the default. Yes, thanks to the extreme self-pity of the believers. <laughs> the, feeling that they, uh, the feeling that they are martyring themselves. And, and also, I think sometimes, you know, the, the, their, their remembrance that you are supposed to be laughed at for being a Christian. Oh, so that it reinforces their martyr yes, yes, sense. it makes them feel much better. But I mean, Stephen it. Carter... I'm, I'm doing something for Calvary <laughs> by making a blithering idiot of myself <laughs> in a science classroom in um, Dover, Pennsylvania. Yeah, absolutely. Well, what they mean, though, in part, is that there's no... I mean, so you can ask this question, how can evangelicals feel disempowered when they're 30 or 40% of the population? Well, because of scenarios like this one. Right? How many evangelicals on this panel? How many evangelicals in the room? Right? And then there's this institution. Well, the New York Times bestseller list, for example, is never going to register the fact that the Left Behind series right. outsells everything that's on that list. Right. Yes, Even Tim LaHaye is our best-selling author. We don't read author. books like that, excuse right. me. Right? Yeah. Um, which are indeed, I mean, if anyone's ever tried them, they are, they are a degradation of the act of reading, but they are, <laughs> they are published in book form. But uh, this, but a good, yeah, go ahead, Mark. No, and I think a good, measure, uh, a, a good measure of what we've been talking about and also the sense of withdrawal and resistance uh, is the homeschooling movement. Yes. And there, are, I would guess, you and I are in complete agreement. I don't know if Noah is, but this is a real problem. There, there are problems that aren't such problems. That is, 
whether it crashes up, you know, symbolic things that don't actually change people's sense of the rules of the game. But when children are being educated in their living rooms by their parents, taking part in no public discussion, even in a private school, about what the rules of the game are, what the rules of science are, and so on, then we have real problems. And so that sense of withdrawal and atomization reaches its extreme in homeschooling, and that, for me, is, is the real problem. But that's not that a class at. issue, or is it? That is, say, it's homeschooling an example of this socioeconomically marginalized group of folks who can't bear this secular culture, or that actually includes professional folks as well? No, it, it, no it, that's it, the farm full of uh, underage virgins. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's expensive form to homeschool. Form of a faith-based yeah. community. It's expensive yeah. to homeschool. Yeah. One, to homeschool, one You would par- say that's a kind of paradigmatic yeah, uh, faith-based community. To, to, it's hard to homeschool, right? Somebody has to, one or both parents, have to have the leisure to be right. at home, right? So, right. in fact, I, I actually, you know, partly it's because I'm a product of religious education, and I, I think that um, I don't, it's not clear to me that homeschooling is so much greater uh, deviation from the development of kind of a mainstream discourse than, than religious education is, for example. I mean, Mark, that, that formulation sounds to me a little bit like the 19th century criticism of Catholic education. You know, it, it took people out of the mainstream and therefore it shouldn't be supported by the state and, and so forth. And it was, the real, it was the real problem for educators and throughout the 19th century, for, for, let's say, for white Protestant educators. So my, my feeling about that is that, and the other feature you see is that the homeschool movement is a movement. The sources that people are reading are, in fact, not just written by the parents at home. They're purchased online. Um, from uh, people whom even Christopher would have to call booksellers. And they're, you know, they're, uh, there's also lots of contact and movement among the people who, uh, you know, the sports teams are just the latest phenomenon that uh, I think the newspaper has reported on. Yeah. Sports teams made up of different homeschooled kids because there is some impulse to, to socialization. But so, yeah. Mark, your, your problem, it sounds like, which is consistent through several things you've said, is that institutions are not only sort of socially stabilized and they're actually, in a way, intellectually uplifting, and they create some kind of social bond. So homeschooling, like atomized churches, disintegrates this, this kind of social glue. Yeah. In fact, I, something I wrote in the Times magazine a couple years ago where I mentioned in a phrase, this is a problem, I, you know, my inbox just for the next month was flooded with things from homeschooling people. And so I read their literature and corresponded with them. And uh, it's true, as you say, that in fact it's, it's all classes are involved in it now. But there seems to be an impulse to depopulate the public school. I was in conversation with a woman in Georgia who wrote to me to say, that she's the head of her homeschooling group in her town, and she pulled her kids out because they were feeling religiously pressured in the public school. And so a kind of pact has been reached in this town that since we cannot talk in the same place about all sorts of issues, we will all leave the public school, and we will all do this privately, all getting things online. That can't be good for anybody. So there's a kind of nostalgia maybe for an earlier time when there was more social solidarity because America was a place where institutions held a power, more powerful, had a more powerful hold on people, including religious institutions. Yeah, because they have a way of bringing people into the norm, te- teaching them the rules of the game, and preventing people, you know, the few nuts from spinning off in, in various isn't directions. This, this is part of Martin Luther's objection to Catholicism in the 16th I mean, he was coming as an individual. He was wrong then, he's the wrong now. Well, there, yeah. oh, so there's the answer, okay? But notice also that, it, notice also that the, the sort of picture of what the world used to be like in, these, in those towns is not a picture of secularism. Mm-hmm. To do what Mark is talking about, you have to have a soft, unofficial religion. I mean, what they had was a soft, unofficial, established Protestantism in the public schools. And that was one of the tools that was used to st- stop people from spinning off. And when secularism comes in the six, 50s and 60s and says, this is wrong, you know, these schools can't have the Bible read, these schools can't have daily prayer, because think of how marginalizing that is to the small numbers of the population who don't, uh, who don't subscribe to these views. At that moment, that this things, things turn, and the schools start to become a place from which the believer wants to withdraw. There, was, there to withdraw. was a very strange thing the other day, though. Uh, I don't know how many people here picked up on it, but I had a lot of friends who did. The Southern Baptist Convention, I think it was, announced they were going to boycott Disney. They were just, they were just uh-huh. bored and depressed and offended by the sort of showbiz values that were pervading everything and everywhere. And they said, no, boycott, boycott this giant corporation that's homogenizing and corrupting. Right. I, I have had quite a few friends who thought, hey, not bad. Not so bad. Know, yeah. I mean, so, uh, nice so, try. So, but let's, let's um, talk about that. Know, just as there are many sort of upscale liberal, 
morally fairly relativist parents who, when the Viagra ad comes 